So hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to what will be our eighth episode of Notugueo Pongyo Gewin, which is uh, the old lady stops visiting. Uh, I'm Christy Belcourt. I'm uh, Métis. My home community is Lac Saint Anne in Alberta. Although I wasn't raised there, I was raised in Ontario. There's a long reason, uh, history, interesting history to me and our family, I guess, of why I'm here. Uh, so I'm in Anishinaabek territory, um, and I've lived here all my life. Uh, I'm currently 56 years old. And uh, the cat's on the, my daughter's cat is here. So you might see like a tail or a head <laughs> of her cat. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm 56 years old um, and have been in menopause for, uh, I, I said six years last night, but it's like five or six because I never really marked it with any kind of, uh, I never marked it down. So I really didn't keep track. Uh, tonight, again, we welcome uh, our guest back, Dr. Janet Smiley, to uh, lead us in a discussion, uh, caring, picking up from yesterday's discussion, which was all about hormones. And tonight, we're going to focus on uh, early onset menopause and the different reasons why a person might uh, experience menopause earlier than um, than. Uh, what they what people would categorize as normal and I say that in quotations because everybody's experience is their normal experience and I don't want to make it sound like it's abnormal to have early onset menopause at all but so we want to uh, explore this issue of what can cause this and what is uh, what are some of the unique symptoms that somebody might experience over and above the regular symptoms that we discussed last night um, so I, I'll leave it there and I'll turn it over to my co-host, Tanya. Hi, so I'm Tanya Capo. I'm from the Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation in Treaty 8 Territory, Northwestern Alberta. I'm coming to you live today from uh, Treaty 1 Territory, Winnipeg. Uh, this is where I live. Um, I am 51 and I'm in perimenopause. It's been ongoing for the last, I'd say, four years. Um, so I'm not quite into menopause yet, but I'm definitely getting there. So um, a couple of things about today's episode. Uh, there's going to be two different discussions. The first one is, as Christine mentioned, the um, early onset menopause. And then the second part is going to be about medical racism. So what I would like to suggest is... In our last episode with, with Dr. Smiley, we had a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, Christy uh, was, had some issues and was kicked out of the Zoom or something. I don't know what happened, but it interrupted our recording. And um, I want to make sure that we don't miss uh, things as much as possible. So I, I would like to suggest if we can, maybe just review the laundry list of menopause symptoms from yesterday just to make sure that we have it out there and then two also following up from our last episode was we had some questions and some things brought up that Dr. Smiley said she would go away um, and spend some time trying to find something out about these questions so maybe we can start with just wrapping up um the last session on those two points and then get into talking about early onset menopause and then finally our, our second part um, talking about medical racism. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Smiley to introduce herself and, and just, just get right into it. Thanks Tanya and Christy for the invitation and to everybody that showed up tonight, I'll say Tansy, um, how are you? I'm Janet Smiley. I'm a Red River Métis with uh, Métis diaspora roots out to Alberta and um, Saskatchewan. Um, and we intermarried um, with some beautiful Cree people. So my direct maternal kin lines go right up to the Edmonton Stragglers and Papas Chases people. Um, and uh, also, um, of course, on my dad's side, I have... Um, uh, Irish settler ancestry. Um, and I am a family doctor. Um, and I've been one for um, a couple of decades. So I've been really lucky um, in that work. 
Um, and I am passionate about the health of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people everywhere, passionate about the health of um, our young people, our women and people with uteruses and our men um, and uh, our gender diverse and two-spirit people. I'm two-spirit. Um, I have a beautiful wife, Nancy Cooper, and Anishinaabe from Rama. Um, I'm a mom and a grandma. Um, and I'm also um, in my day job, uh, I do research. So that's why I went away and looked at some of those answers. So I try to work in a good way um, with First Nations, Inuit and Métis and Indigenous Health Service providers um, to see what we can do about creating health services that are actually generative, that make us feel good, right? That um, promote um, and support attachment um, to all our relatives through the ages. Um, so uh, thanks again. Um, for this opportunity. It's been really inspiring. We had some good discussions last night. So the laundry list, the bread and butter of uh, the menopause uh, shopping list are hot flashes um, and vaginal symptoms, dry vaginas. And um, along with that can go um, symptoms of um, having to urinate right? And maybe losing a little bit of urine. So they call that the genital urinary system, right? So uh, because uh, we have a hammock in our pelvises that support our uteruses and our bladders, um, and that hammock um, can get um, stretched um, as um, if we have given birth to children vaginally. Um, and then um, once our estrogen um, decreases, um, then the hammock can get a little weak. But I think you're going to have someone on to talk all about Kegel exercises and stuff like that. Um, so we talked a little bit like um, about how to manage some of those symptoms. Um, we still, we because that can make um, sex very uncomfortable, we talked about vaginal lubricants. So check that out. And we can have more conversations about that because we didn't solve all those problems. So I'm like, yeah, we need to get like a sex specialist coming here too to talk about how to enjoy um, sex through the life cycle. Um, so we talked quite a bit about how to manage and our experiences of hot flashes. So check out last night's webinar on that. But then there was the secret shopping list, some secret, some not so secret. So other things that are the not so secret stuff is like also then um, sleep problems, brain fog, um, joint pain, um, and mood stuff. Okay, and then the hidden shopping list that we might be experiencing but not aware of um, until we fall or break a bone is we can, um, our bones um, can become a little thinner and that can be a problem as well if people are um, prone to thin bones. If you have people in your family that have um, fallen, women that have fallen and broken a hip. Um, the way to manage that is to keep on doing weight bearing exercise, which I think a lot of our women historically um, and people with uteruses had to do even after they went through this big life change. And then the other one um, is our risk of heart disease. Um, so that increases as well. So um, people who have uteruses and um, estrogen in their bodies actually um, have less heart attacks um, before menopause, like under the age of 50, than um, people who have testosterone in men. Um, but we catch up as uh, women and um, people with uteruses um, after our estrogen levels drop. Um, some of the questions, there was such good questions um, asked. So people asked about um, diabetes um, and menopause. Um, and it turns out that women that do have diabetes might be more likely to go into early menopause. Um, and then another thing that can happen um, that we didn't talk about is actually because our metabolism changes a little bit through menopause, um, there can be um, a change in weight. Um, and then, of course, if there's a change in weight and also hypertension, I talked about my own experience about um once I went through menopause, I'm um, 54 coming on 55. So I've been in menopause for three years and there's some high blood pressure that runs in my family. I thought, oh good, I didn't get that gene from my dad's family. But then as soon as I went through menopause, I did have it. So those are risk factors for diabetes. There was questions about new allergies in menopause. 
Um, it turns out we talked about the amazing world of hormones. So, and how there's so many different kind of estrogen receptors. So it turns out that estrogen, right, which is a hormone, right? It's a organic chemical hormone. Um, it does talk to our immune system. Um, and it's our immune system that can result in allergies. So estrogen actually attaches to some things called mast cells, which release histamine, which is what causes us to have a big allergic or sneezing attack. So some allergies might actually get better when you go through the menopause because there's less estrogen. But then you could have, because our skin can get dry through menopause, so then you can actually, um, if you're um, having skin sensitivities, I have very sensitive skin, just a delicate um, flower I am. Um, so, um, and I noticed you'll even notice, yeah, I got more irritated skin. I got acne a little bit um, and some more irritated skin. So I have to, I'm taking a little anti-inflammatory cream for that. Uh, another question was about the oral contraceptive pill. Does it cause early menopause? So I confirm there's no evidence that it does. Another question, this was a big question around polycystic ovary and menopause. So thank you. So that can actually affect menopause. It can cause it to be a little later. Polycystic ovary syndrome is um, a condition where you um, have higher levels of androgens and testosterone, right? So um, some of the um, symptoms there then can be irregular periods um, and um, difficulty um, with fertility and reproduction. Um, but it also causes other changes to our metabolism, right? Like to the way our body um, absorbs and processes and burns fuels and sugar. So one thing is that you can't actually diagnose it when you go through menopause anymore. So that part that I shared was correct, right? Because remember, we get menopause because the eggs in our uterus are used up. So when before menopause, you can see that the ovaries are sometimes big and have um, some enlarged eggs and cysts in there, um, which can be painful. But it turns more into a metabolic challenge. So people with polycystic ovary, and we talked about how, um, yeah, there's actually sugar receptors in the uterus and stuff like that. So um, people would be um, more prone to type 2 diabetes um, and other inflammation issues. Um, so um, and then the last one, somebody asked a question. They said that um, they, someone told them if they lost weight, I think it was, then they would have um, a release of estrogen because estrogen is stored in fat. But um, I didn't think that would happen because estrogen gets broken down pretty quickly in the body. Um, so estrogen is produced by fat. Um, but and if we um, have a little extra um, then um, that will be a source of estrogen. Um, but yeah, if we lose it, it um, shouldn't cause a release of estrogen as far as I know. So those were um, what I found out about those questions. Thanks for those. I loved looking at that. Um, maybe I'll turn it back to you, Christy and Tanya. We can um, start talking a little bit about early menopause. Mm -hmm. That was, that was, thank you so much. That was so generous of you to spend your time to look, look up those answers to those questions and really interesting, you know, interesting to know about, about all the different th aspects of what a person can go through. And I had no idea about even the question of estrogen being in fat, let alone what the answer would be to whether or not you, um, it weight loss would cause a release of that almost like this is a bad analogy but like carbon in the atmosphere when you're you know deforestation you know, you know bad analogy but yeah okay um so <laughs> tanya's just like grabbing your glasses like oh my god <laughs> yeah not a good analogy um okay so we did have some questions that we sent to you in advance uh we're going to talk about the first uh, we're, we're going to divide this uh, into two, as Tanya was mentioning. Um, the first part will be about early onset menopause and then about halfway through the time, the time is now 620. So in about 40 minutes or so, we should probably switch over to the, um, 
the second half of our of the webinar, which will be on medical racism and how that all affects a person's experience as trying to access perhaps healthcare through through the menopause transition transition. So one of the questions that we had uh, for you was, um, yeah, we're I'm just looking at our paper that, uh, here. Um, yeah, so uh, it's just again, like yesterday, we went over like, okay, all about hormones, what are they? What do they do? In this case, we want to ask you, what is, how is early onset menopause defined? What does it include? What doesn't it include? So for example, is surgical menopause different from what would be called early onset menopause? Let's get our definitions straight and what these things are exactly, and then get into uh, what what is and isn't. Uh, for example, if a person has a hysterectomy, is does that naturally throw them into menopause and all those kinds of things. So we'll just, we'll start with the definitions of what is early onset menopause, what does it include, what doesn't it include, and how else might a person come to menopause earlier than perhaps the age of 50 or their late 40s? Awesome. Thanks, Christy. So, and again, so I can share like what the medical textbook says, and then the good thing is we can um, just uh, change all these definitions or um, go ask our families and our relatives and our knowledge keepers and elders to find out what our own um, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis ideas are. Um, but in general, um, going through menopause is a transition. We talked a lot about that. I was working pretty hard last night to, um, like, uh, I've been working hard in my life too, to frame it as like uh, just another stage of life. We can step into our power. Um, but yeah, we want to be understanding this big impact of the hormone changes, just like um, we do now celebrate and think more about rites of passage when our young people are um, going through hormone changes as well. Um, so the textbook says early menopause is menopause that happens when you're younger than 45. Um, and then they call it premature, which I think is a bit of a deficit-based word, um, if it's younger than 40. Um, so the best predictor of when a woman um, or a person with a uterus might go through menopause uh, is um, like finding out um, about when their relatives um, went through menopause. Um, so there. Um, so for me asking, like uh, my uh, I had lost my mom before she went through menopause, but I um, had some aunties I could ask and, and cousins that I could ask. Um, now. People can go through menopause um, early, so it could be related. So some people that might experience early menopause, they might find out other people in their family went through. So it's similar to um, if just asked around, like um, actually I went through menarche, like uh, puberty a bit later, but luckily my older sister, that had already happened to her. So she, like, uh, and then that's just a trend um, in one of the branches of my family. So that could be something that could happen in your family if you know that history. Um, some things could um, cause you to go through um, earlier menopause, um, like, uh, for example, um, athletes, like extreme athletes or people that have had anorexia, right? Then, then you can um, actually um, stop your periods, and then that might have you go through earlier menopause. But the most common reason why people with uteruses um, go through early menopause in addition to the family reasons is um, what's called surgical menopause or medical menopause, right? So, um, and it's the ovaries that are key, right? So for example, um, some people know um, about like a breast cancer gene, BRCA. So um, like if you have this gene, you might be more likely to have breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So then um, there's um, people in my circles and, you know, that I've cared for that they actually chose to have their ovaries removed, right? Before they went through menopause. So if your ovaries are removed, um, then you will go through menopause early. 
it's rare we like some people might have to have their ovaries removed maybe because there was a tumor in their ovary right and again we have two of them um but um if it was a certain kind of cancerous tumor maybe they would take out both um or you would decide hopefully it's not they taking them out it's hopefully there would be a discussion a person would be presented with choices and it might be okay well i don't want to go through early menopause right because some of the things all the symptoms are the same but like it also then um means that you'll have more time in your life perhaps to have the thinning of the bones and um you know your cardiovascular risk and all those kinds of things and when it happens surgically it happens much more abruptly so the symptoms are the same but it can happen very abruptly um what's more common too though again um and there's a whole area like of women's health and gynecology where they're trying to do less invasive surgeries um so it's getting less common but sometimes people might be um having their uterus removed surgically um most times the uterus might get removed surgically cuz somebody was having very heavy bleeding or again um the lining of the uterus that amazing positive um lining of the uterus that generates new life any part of the body that has that generative life force goes through a lot of changes um it can be prone to overgrowth and uncontrolled overgrowth in the human body is cancer right so um luckily um that's why it's really important if you're having irregular menstrual periods and especially around the time of menopause if you have a primary health care provider we're going to talk about how that can be hard to have but it is important to try to get that checked out because it might not just be that you're going through menopause it could be like there's an overgrowth in the lining of your uterus and you can't tell the difference um between those two things um so um it's important maybe then to get an ultrasound or have somebody check that out. Um, if you have your uterus removed, say, because there was like overgrowth or some other problem in your uterus and you were informed about it and decide, okay, I'll have my uterus um, removed, that's called a hysterectomy. Most times, um, if you're premenopausal, um, your ovaries would remain inside your body. But just by having that hysterectomy can, even though you still have your ovaries, um, you might go into menopause a little bit earlier. Um, another even more common surgery is a tubal ligation. And of course, um, we've all been probably thinking about that because of the fact that um, First Nations Inuit Métis women were getting uh, tubal ligation surgery without proper informed consent. Um, so that's when... Um, the connectors between the ovaries and the uterus, those fallopian tubes are tied off, right? Like, uh, or cut. And um, that means that the eggs can't get from the ovaries to the uterus anymore. So you can't get pregnant. Um, even by having a tubal ligation, um, just because it's interfering with this beautiful landscape of our bodies and the hormone signals, um, that will that has been shown to cause menopause to come a little bit earlier, about two years earlier, um, but in a graduated way. So the most abrupt kind of surgical menopause happens when the ovaries are actually removed, both of them, for some reason. The most common reason might be um, because there was cancer or a risk of cancer. Um, and then that actually causes a terrible um like a very um abrupt menopause so the symptoms are there right but it's just more um intense um because you go like remember we were saying like it's this beautiful waves of hormones every moon cycle and then the way I used to describe it in perimenopause it starts getting a bit creaky it's like eat oh <laughs> right like that's a little sharper so then the surgical menopause it's like the cliff dive okay so that's why it would be really important so these are really important discussions anybody that's making those choices so that would be a circumstance where you might actually want to think about hormone replacement at least over the short term so you could maybe create like something steadier. So remember, even, you know, if you're on hormone replacement and you're going off with same 
talk to somebody, we have our tricks. And we ended up taking a whole bunch of people off um, hormone replacement when a big heart study came out in 2001, because we used to think, oh, it'll be good to be on estrogen and menopause. It'll protect from heart attacks because we knew our heart attacks increased when we went through menopause, but then we found out, oh, that logic didn't work. And estrogen's a bit sticky um, and it can increase our risk of heart attacks. So now, and that's where we're going to get to with the medical racism, because the big problem is we're short across the country now, trusted primary health care providers, people are tired and burnt out, and then there's racism in the system. But every woman going through this life change, it would be really great then because there's all these different factors to think about. We want them to have a trusted care provider, right? We brought in doulas and Indigenous midwives to protect us at the time of birthing because we knew that's at a very important time with lots of complex decision making. But we don't have it for menopause yet. Um, chemical... Um, or medical menopause could be um, because you have to take some kinds of medicines that are toxic. So chemotherapy um, being a common one. So there's some agents, um, some chemotherapy medicines that are medicines that you take to kill cancer cells in your body. Um, and of course, those are targeted because the cancer cells, remember, they're like uncontrolled growth cells. Um, so some of those um, would also then... Um, and your um, fertility and um, like uh, they would um, result in your ovaries not functioning anymore. Um, so then um, that would be medical menopause. So that's the surgical menopause is having the ovaries removed by a surgery. Medical menopause would be having the ovaries um, basically um, be um, not functioning anymore because of chemo, right? Um, and then there's other surgeries that could just bring on menopause sooner, like the tubal ligation or the hysterectomy, but it wouldn't necessarily bring on menopause right away. Obviously, when you've had a hysterectomy, you don't get periods anymore, um, but you um, wouldn't necessarily have um, the hot flashes and the vaginal dryness because your ovaries can still function, um, but you um, will most likely go through menopause sooner than you would if you hadn't had the uterus removed or the hysterectomy surgery. That, that is really, thank you for clarifying all of, all of that for us. So um, the idea that somebody can go through uh, early onset menopause uh, naturally to the best um, indicator of that would be to your fam other family members. Right, uh, would be able yeah. kind of, uh, give you a clue. It might just be something that runs in the family. Mm -hmm. And then with the uh, the hysterectomy, that, uh, thank you for clarifying that because we did have one question a number of episodes ago that we weren't able to answer at the time, which was, uh, and somebody had messaged me to say, I'm really afraid of having a hysterectomy. She was having problems with her um, with her her uterus. And uh, and and that was what was going to be removed, not the ovaries. And so, but she was afraid that it was going to put her into this abrupt um, menopause. And she was debating whether to live with um, with the pain, uh, the ongoing pain of what she was experiencing, uh, just to avoid the abrupt menopause. So it's nice to know that that. Uh, is not necessarily what will happen. It might put you into menopause, but it might be a little bit gentler um, than than the surgical removery of ovaries, which is good to clarify that there are different kinds of hysterectomies and that these things are, you know, and also tubal ligation can affect um, a, a person's experience. So that that is uh, something that I didn't know. So that's really interesting. I was wondering about the, um, when people go, are going through early onset menopause. Um, so they're experiencing menopause, let's say before the age of 40 or even before the age of 45, um, where what are the kinds of, of things that they might experience within the healthcare system where they, you know, we can imagine that uh, maybe they wouldn't be believed or they would be dismissed, or some of the symptoms like if they're having um, 
insomnia or some of the more, you know, worries about maybe heart, heart cardiac uh, issues. If they're having those kind of issues come up because they're in, they've had experienced early onset menopause, what are the kinds of things that they might experience uh, as a patient um, and what might doctors, uh, what, what would bad doctors do <laughs> and what shouldn't they do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's important to remember that's why we want to have trusted healthcare providers who are going to be respectful. And then just even with all the um, shame that uh, was um, a big piece of um, like uh, Europatriarchy and the church about even just menstruation right? Like, can um, how that has um, caused some breakdown in our own communications about menstruation and, and menarche. So then it could even take a bit of courage for someone to talk about their irregular periods. And it's not only like, I know, um, you know, if we hear about a young woman, you know, who's getting their menstruation, you know, at a young age, like at eight or nine, you know what I mean? That young woman has to have a bit more courage, right? Because she might be the first in her group of girls, like it's still, so the same thing if these changes are happening. So I guess I would, the, I would hope that if people are having irregular menstrual periods, I wish that we could just um, make sure that there was care providers that would be listening, right? And it is if you are not getting your period and it's a good thing to go see your care provider and have a trusted, um, yeah, and hopefully they would take you seriously. So I guess, unfortunately, I never um, fail to be surprised um, at, uh, you know, how people get treated, but um, for somebody in their forties um, to not be having periods, right? Like that's, um, yeah, something that needs to be assessed and taken seriously. Um, I think that, um, so um, any primary care provider should know that, um, yeah, that could be early menopause. Remember, you have to have no periods for one year. And remember during that whole time of irregular periods to make sure you still use birth control, right? We said that again, and sorry, that's my little family doctor coming. But um, yeah, sometimes people think, oh, goody, I don't have to worry about birth control anymore. But yeah, a little over a little egg can still sneak out, right? That's why they so you have to wait a whole year. And that's an interesting thing, eh? Because we have some teachings, you know, go through one year um, before you uh accept this change or this loss, right? Um, so you gotta go one through one whole year and then uh then um you're probably safe um to not get pregnant. Um though. Yeah, you might want to go get a confirmation. There are some blood tests that can help you <laughs> confirm that too, because uh, somebody's going to go one year and one day and get pregnant and call me up. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would uh, worry that um, an insensitive healthcare provider um, would just dismiss somebody or not um, take it seriously that they weren't having their periods or blame them, wonder if it's something about their lifestyle. Because remember... I said, if people like are very slender, like as dream athletes, um, but just, um, yeah, if somebody's been stressed or they've had like severe food insecurity, um, then you can skip periods and miss periods as well. So um, yeah, blame, blame a person um, for what they're going through. Um, and that's really bad because like I said too, right? Irregular periods could also be a sign like of, um, like overgrowth or cancer. So it needs to be taken seriously. And then at that change, remember I was wishing like we all need then to have a longer conversation. And if this change and transition is happening a little earlier, we want to be extra careful and support people like to have good bone health because uh, we hope they're still going to live to be a hundred. So they'll be going 60 years instead of 50 years without that estrogen to contribute to the good bone health. So there's other things we can do, like make sure we get enough vitamin D and calcium in our diet. And um, if we can, and we're mobile, um, keep up that weight bearing activity. So that's something that somebody would want to know with the cardiovascular um, risks that increase when we don't have estrogen anymore. You know, what are the things that are in our control too? So we can um, like, uh, ensure good cardiovascular health. And again, 
um, without putting too much undue stress or pressure on people. Because of course, um, yeah, it's there's many reasons why it's very hard for us to say stop using commercial tobacco um, in the form of cigarettes or um, yeah exercise. So I'm not assuming everybody can just do all those things, but they, it would be even more important to try to support them and, and figure those things out. I always say um, that I believe in uh, everybody. One of my favorite reasons for people coming in is if they wanted to talk about like uh, stopping their um, commercial tobacco use, right? Um, and it takes five or six quit attempts, but I never try to shame anybody. So that's the other thing that can backfire. People will get blamed or there'll be a negative message, right? Like many of us, we have bodies in all kinds of shapes and sizes for all kinds of reasons, including multi-generational colonial reasons or um, other kinds of um, interferences in our relationships with our body. So yet the last thing somebody in early menopause needs when they're already dealing with all these changes is to be shamed, you know, um, because they're um, still finding a friend in that tobacco stick or um, because they um, haven't had the luxury of time to stay fit, fit or physically active or because there's somebody that's in a big body. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things I would worry about and wish wouldn't happen. So I have like just a couple of... Um follow-up questions and maybe a comment um so I'm just going to put them all out there and then you can respond yeah. okay so the first one is when you were talking about um a hysterectomy and how you know it's like the sudden departure of that from your body and it could make menopause rough it, it kind of made me think about um, my first pregnancy and I had a cesarean I had no labor whatsoever. I just went right to a cesarean and it was really tough afterwards because suddenly the baby's gone, you know, and now my body has to instantly adjust. So I just can't imagine how tough it might be for uh, people with uteruses to have to go through the removal of that without no support. So I, 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 I think that's something I would like to talk about maybe at another time more is how to, to manage that and how to get through those things. The other question was um, also about hysterectomy. You mentioned that it could be, could it, could it be, okay, so am I understanding correctly that you have a full hysterectomy, that's where you get your uterus and your ovaries out at one time, or a partial hysterectomy where you get one or the other out? Is, are, are those the proper terms for that? Actually, um, the um, when you get your um, uterus and your ovaries removed, that's a hysterosalpingectomy, right? Like or hysteroophorectomy. Removing the ovaries is an oophorectomy. Um, yeah, the fallopian tubes, they say salpingo, um, and then the uterus is the history. So it would be a hysterectomy, bilateral oophorectomy to have, mm -hmm. but the full hysterectomy, you remove the whole um, uterus, including the bottom part, the cervix, right? And then the partial hysterectomy, um, they leave the upper part of the, uh, they leave part of the uterus there, but I'm, yeah, not up to date enough in my surgical terms. So I might have to um, <laughs> clarify that on the chat after. One thing that we could do. So one thing that I love, and there's a whole bunch of clever surgeons who are trying to um, do uterine sparing surgery. So for example, a common condition is big uterine fibroids. They're uncomfortable. They hurt people. They can cause very heavy bleeding. So that used to be a common um, reason for removing the uterus. And like what you said, Tanya, it's a major surgery, right? I had a cesarean too, right? So it's hard to lift things, right? Like, and, you know, we're busy people. Um, so um, the there's like, 
uterine sparing procedures now and all these clever surgeons like so just like now when you need a gall gallbladder removed right they can try to do it with the little scopes and stuff like that sometimes if it's really stuck in there you still have to get a little incision like they can go in and just remove some of the fibroids and stuff so that's where I think and when we get to the part on the medical racism and stuff we need networks and maybe you could invite there are some um like uh indigenous obstetricians gynecologists so they could come and even answer those questions better and talk a little bit about all these new advances and that's an important thing for people to be aware of too because as these new um like surgeries come where they just remove the minimal amount of things and instead of doing a big open incision they use a little scope um, where they can remove things through the vagina, which maybe sounds scary to people, but actually at least there's a passage that way anyways, instead of going through the abdomen. So then you're going to heal up better. They don't have to cut through all your abdominal muscles. So, so I saw that some... question. Mm, go oh, ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, do they call that less evasive procedures? Yeah, minimally in invasive exactly okay. It, okay yeah invasive like uh, and uh yeah uterine sparing surgeries yeah mm -hmm. sure. okay. um and, and just uh two other quick comments um in terms of like advocating for yourself i'm finding that it's not always the case that the medical provider is um, subconsciously or consciously racist towards you, but just seems that there's a lack of knowledge um, in general around menopause. So I, I go back to my frozen shoulder experience when it started happening and I had no idea what it was. And I went to my regular doctor who's fantastic. She's lovely. I could talk to her about anything. Um, she didn't know what it was and that was fine. Oh, so she sent me to a sports medicine person. So I go to the sports medicine person who's also a lady. And she says right away, oh, you got frozen shoulder. So first time I ever heard of this, I was bamboozled by this condition. How can this happen? I didn't understand it. So I was trying to find answers and I couldn't really find any. I had no underlying conditions that would have caused it according to the literature I was reading. But when I started doing research for this discussion series, I picked up one book called uh, The Menopause Boot Camp. And as I was reading through it, it said frozen shoulder is associated with people in menopause. And so it, I, I thought, gee, you know, my, my regular doctor didn't even think of my age. And the sports doctor didn't even think of my age to say, oh, you, this is this is men a menopause thing. Are you starting menopause? Because I was already into perimenopause. So I think that um, when we're talking about the medical racism to just, I really want to think about uh, just also not just advocating for yourself in those instances where you're feeling, you know, some kind of aggression or negativity, but just to advocate for yourself in general. Like, had I known, I like even me, my mind wasn't even there to say, well, is it associated with my age or, you know, anything like this? So all that awareness would be great. And just the, the one more comment. Yesterday, you said menopause is actually one day. It's the one day after the one year period or the one year time that you didn't get your period. And then after it's just that one day, and then after that, you're post-menopause. So some of the conversations that we've been having in this discussion series is wanting to think about what are our ways, what were our ways of sort of celebrating this. It's like its own ceremony, like how do we market, you know, like you were mentioning, there's coming of age for our young ones with uteruses who have their first moon time and we do all of those things so we were trying to talking about you know what what was there and asking these questions and trying to figure out and then thinking about well how could we even measure how do we even know when we're in menopause you know and I think that you saying that it's actually just that one day 
I think that makes it possible to have a market occasion to do something about it. So I just I just wanted to put that out there because it just I thought it was really cool because I didn't know menopause was actually only one day. <laughs> yeah, I love um the idea, right? Like, and I can see it already. And then um, something about because it is like, oh, grandma's not coming anymore. And of course, we love our first grandmother. But I always wonder, okay, well, maybe she feels like we're okay now. Right, because she came for that whole time to help us with this powerful thing of reproduction. But now we are like uh, becoming an older woman, and that's a power stage, right? But yeah, and then even like some kind of little card, like it's like a special occasion. We could work together on a graphic and something to call it, <laughs> and we could celebrate and yeah, put it on Facebook or or something like that. And then uh, yeah, we go through that year. But then in that year. So the whole period is called perimenopause, right? Like uh, that's around menopause. Um, but yeah, and it's really important as we shouldn't wait the whole 12 months before we go talk to somebody about it, right? Because it's the uh, irregular periods. We need to kind of get that checked out and getting prepared, right? So then there's that preparation by the time we get to that one day. Um, Grandma Google's off, awesome. So here you can just put partial hysterectomy in and you can see it. So I was, mm -hmm. sometimes I just doubt myself. Remember last time I said, I thought I knew everything about women's health when I was like 24 um, and now <laughs> I'm 54 and I went through menopause. So it is, it leaves the cervix behind, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes like, so the total hysterectomy, if somebody had cervical cancer that was invasive, maybe they would have to remove that. So Surgeons are getting better. They're stopping just randomly picking out parts of like the bodies of women and people with uteruses, right? Like, and that's why. So let me know. I can try to track down some awesome uh, uh, surgeons. There's um, my uh, friend, Don, Dr. Don Wilson, who's um, one of the first First Nations obstetricians, gynecologists. So he'll be all up to speed on that. And uh, he's a really good advocate too. But yeah, so the... Um, Radical hysterectomy removes the uterus, cervix, and upper part of the vagina. Radical surgeries are never gentle, right? That's like the radical mastectomy. They actually used to take out part of the chest muscle. That's what they used to do a long time ago for breast cancer, right? So then women that had had breast cancer, they wouldn't even be able to use their arm properly anymore. So fortunately, um, they're thinking about joint sparing. You know, the thing about um, the frozen shoulder, it's funny, because that was something that I didn't think about as much the joint pain, like, so it's documented now, and at least in the training courses for doctors in menopause, the one that I um, took, but didn't finish yet, it talks about the joint pain. It's funny, because for frozen shoulder, yeah, again, it goes into the MSK part of my practice, which I was never great at, but it's common, you know what I mean? Because even though I love the human body, the shoulder is kind of a shallow, shallow um, ball and socket joint. So then there's four ligaments, you know, all about this Tanya that kind of attach it. And then it's in a little special capsule and that gets frozen. It hurts though. Yeah. So I think I might've missed that too. Right. But then that's the hard part. Cause you don't just know if you, people are missing it. Cause it's just not connecting and we can keep educating ourselves and you know as we have these conversations right now and because you raised it and I yeah joint pain right is something and then you saw that frozen shoulder um, but it is I mean it's really hard in primary care that's why I always um, did best in positions where it's kind of on a salary because the way like a lot of primary care providers get paid it's like how many patients you <laughs> see in a day versus like how many patients do you keep healthy right so that's like there's all these pressures and people are tired so then you want to have a longer conversation so some things that could happen is some um, you could let it your if you do have a primary health care provider you could say I need to have a longer conversation about menopause right um like uh, so then they could um so you could say can I have a longer appointment like uh, to the receptionist it's so hard though because I know a lot of people they just give up they can't even get through um so and then um like uh bringing somebody with you right so just the same way that sometimes like with um like birthing and prenatal care and stuff like that or if we're afraid in the hospital so 
just bringing somebody with you as a support person, you're always allowed to have somebody in your appointment, even if they're just there for the talking part, right? And then um, I think, and even like in this webinar collective, we could come up with like just a little, um, like we've, I've been speaking and and stuff, but there are actually like, um, and you I'm sure you've seen them and maybe you shared them already, right? Like just some common things to talk about during menopause. Um, if you are in an area where, you know, you have like healthcare providers, you could say, can I come in again? Like, can I have a series of conversations about menopause? Um, because um, like uh, that's the thing that healthcare provider may have only even on their schedule and that's a system they don't control. They might only have 10 minutes for the appointment. Um, so those are some things that we could think about. But yeah, I think we need to like um, support this whole, we've got a doula helper, birth helper movement and Indigenous midwife movement. There's no reason why Indigenous midwives couldn't become expert um, and like, well, I don't know about the word expert, but they could become the helpers and knowledge keepers and um, like for, for change of life with menopause too, right? Because we used to go all the way um, through the life cycle. Thank you for that. Uh, it's so we should um, just to respect your time uh, and get to the second part. There's some really good questions in the Q&A and I feel bad that we have to move on to the second half of, of the subjects that we wanted to cover. And I'm wondering if uh, we could maybe, if we have the time, go back and revisit those afterwards, uh, because I, they're, they're questions that, that I really would, would feel better if we could answer rather than just closing it off without answering them. But um, so you, people, you, you are a medical doctor, you're a family doctor, but you're also a researcher. And uh, one of the areas that you've done uh, a lot of extensive research on and advocacy is around uh, racism within the healthcare uh, field. And maybe you could just uh, describe what that, what that is. Uh, of course, I think we probably already know uh, or have some ideas what it is or have experienced it and and uh, and just give us a little bit of insight into some of the research you've done. Sure. Um, thanks um, for that question. So I say, um, unfortunately, racism is like Baskin Robbins ice cream, like there's 30 different flavors of it, right? And all these different words. Um, so um, like uh, the when we just say racism, a lot of people might just think, oh, that's like somebody yelling like terrible insults, right? Or like uh, at you, like they had too much to drink and some person is like uh, saying something terrible like about um, to me um, because they know I'm Métis, right? Like, uh, um, but it can, people know it can be attacks, um, you know, we can get killed um, because we're um, like, uh, First Nations, Inuit, or Métis. So um, one definition I really like is about um, being treated differently um, because of race. Um, and it's an action. It's an action um, where people who are already experiencing um, adversity, right? Like uh, because of race, um, like our, um, there's an, a, a person does an action that actually um, makes that um, worse. Um, but yeah, that kind where people are saying insults, like it's at that individual level. And then a lot of times in healthcare, I always say, I think the most dangerous form is actually unintentional racism because people say, oh, well, it's, it wasn't racist because I didn't mean to hurt the person. But doesn't matter. It matters like how it's received. Um, but that's called attitudinal racism right? And that can happen. So um, like, uh, for example, people just have stereotyped ideas about First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and even when they're trying to help. Um, so um, like the most common stereotype about us is um, that we um, have an alcohol um, use issue, right? And then um, our people get mistreated um, when they're having a stroke or um, like confused because they're um, diabetes isn't um, in good control. 
Um, so, but there's other kinds and we know, so like colonization, right? Um, was um, a form of like policy and systemic racism, like Tara Nellis, right? Like that's a systemically racist policy. The Indian Act um, is racist, right? Like, uh, so it um, is a group of non-Indigenous people saying like who's Indigenous or not and, and setting up ridiculous sexist rules about that, right? I mean, um, it because of the other kinds of racist processes of colonization, yeah, we sometimes, some of our um, own leaders and say, well, it might be worse if we get rid of it because at least it acknowledges like some treaty rights. And then of course, some um, those treaties like were sacred ceremonies um, and commitments um, for the First Nations leaders that signed them. Then there's organizational racism, right? So that can just be, like I say, well, hospitals were set up without Indigenous people in mind, right? So the way the whole hospital system is set up, it's set up for non-Indigenous people, right? So it's not, and it's moving, like it's not very friendly, you don't get greeted. Like, I mean, I guess, I don't know who designs them now. I mean, I guess I try to <laughs> help with the design, right? But even the way we fund them, like a capitalist model, right? Like bigger is better. Let's take that one hospital and put it in a hospital network and then we can save even more money, right? Um, so yeah, it's um, set up with a different set of values. Like um, let's try to do things cheaply, right? Like, or save money. Right. Let's uh, versus um, I can remember one of the things I always liked about working in small and more rural hospitals. Right. Like and again, after COVID, this might be a bad idea. But I remember, um, you know, why can't we just bring some of the babies, like cuddle them up and take them over to the ward of our elders? Because look, that'll make people so happy. Right. To see some young babies. But of course, you can't do that because it's a hospital policy. Um, about it. So um, that's institutional racism, like, uh, and where we're getting, um, like, you know, so instead, we try to set up the fact that Health Canada doesn't have a chief midwifery officer, right? You know that I was just at a meeting because I get to work on racism in healthcare. Now I'm on an expert advisory for the National Health Service. So that helps a little bit because then here in Canada, if I'm trying to say something and they just say a lot of times that we know as some um, like uh, people that are trying to speak our minds people will dismiss us you know what I mean like or say oh that's just Janet she's not a very good scientist she's just because she's too passionate when I give a talk um, I actually have to say if it's a data talk I just have to say I'm unusual like I'll present my data like the this information with passion and I said because it's human beings it's my relatives that I'm talking about but I have to say, please don't mistake that, like for a lack of rigor, right? Like in my methods. Um, so yeah, there's some, a lot of racism out there, um, but I almost lost my train of thought, but I just hung back on to it. Um, I've been advocating for a long time because we have a chief medical officer, um, like uh for Indigenous Health, Indigenous Services Canada, that's Dr. Tom Wong. The amazing Evan Adams was the deputy chief. He just retired from that. Um, but I'm like, when are we going to get a chief midwifery office? In the belly of the beast, um, the UK has a chief midwifery officer. I'm like, why can't we have a chief Indigenous midwifery officer? So anyways, I want all that. So that's another form, I guess, of um, organizational and systemic racism that... Uh, yeah, Health Canada doesn't recognize um, midwives or use them in their models that they've imposed on us. So when people are going to, to access health care uh, and they, you know, the, the, it's not explicit. The racism wouldn't be the insults or the direct that you, that you describe and it isn't even, as you say, unintentional or ad attitudinal, because it's it's maybe the the doctor is just not taking people's concerns seriously, not taking their pain seriously. Um, so many examples uh, that that I know personally of people who 
when they're, they won't be prescribed pain medication to manage their pain because they're Indigenous, but for non-Indigenous people or people who don't present as Indigenous people, they uh, will be prescribed pain medication for the same thing. So it's, there's the, it's like insidious, right, within the healthcare system. And it, it, it's almost like patients are gaslit in a way that they feel like they're not like it's almost like uh they're they're being told that it's not racism or that they're not being treated different but they know in their gut that they are and what makes it really difficult is the, it, combined with in uh that people don't have sometimes access to health care they have to take the person like the nurse at the nursing station or the doctor that visits their community once a month, they have to take what they can get. And so it becomes really difficult, I think, for patients in some circumstances to be able to advocate for themselves. And so I just thought, I wanna know what your thoughts are around that and maybe some of your findings uh, that you've uh, uncovered in your research. Yeah, so thanks, Christine. I was thinking about it's really crazy making. So what you're talking about, like is like differential treatment, right? Like in another word, I got this from the amazing Dr. Barry Lavalley. Like it's so as healthcare providers, we have like clinical practice guidelines, right? Like all the stuff I'm trying to share with you, like I'm trying to get up to date, right? So that we have to do a heart health assessment. You know, there's some absolute reasons why we shouldn't be prescribing hormones, like if you have um, like a bad liver problems, right? Like, or um, like a history of um, breast cancer. But what happens is people just don't give the same level of care. So we call that non-clinical practice guideline adherence, right? So if you have a condition um, that um, you're in acute pain, so for example, um, one of the most famous studies is a study that shows that people who are Black and Hispanic in big emergency rooms in the U.S. are less likely than people who are white to get adequate pain treatment for the long, when their femurs are fractured. That's a long bone fracture. That's very painful. Because for the longest time, and you also spoke about um, like the denial, right? And so sometimes I say it might almost be better if you had a healthcare provider who was making like really racist statements. Like, you know, um, one thing I got once from a senior administrator at a university was that Métis people are um, hard to work with um, because they're angry and disorganized, right? Like or something, I'd rather hear that. Like, oh, you're Métis, that's why you're angry. Cause then I know that person's racist. But like we're literally getting killed with kindness and it's patronizing kindness though. Um, so um, it's severe, it's common. Um, so in some of the studies I've done in cities like, um, and it's usually underreported, right? Because one of the ways we manage racism because it's happening every day, I mean, I get miscoded and I'm a little fairer, right? Like, uh, so, you know, I don't get subject to that same kind of racism as my my partner, my partner Nancy does, for example, like it's rarer that I'll get followed around a store. Um, I, um, but uh, yeah, um, so to cope with that, people might, it's okay. And it's okay. You don't have to acknowledge it all the time because it's crazy making, right? But when um, like one out of four people like uh, in Toronto um, said that they experienced racism um, when they were um, from their healthcare providers, right? And it it then it just discourages people from going in, right? So of the people that experience racism, the large majority then it did delay their access to healthcare. So it's wrong, right? I have um something on my whole life um uh by Dr. Martin Luther King, and it says of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And it's hypocritical, right? So there's a defensiveness in Canada and a denial. I mean, the conversation started. But yeah, people then, it's hard to raise it 
because then people will get mad and say they're not racist. I've heard of hospitals and seen terrible, terrible racism. And there's hot spots. Emergency rooms are bad, right? Um, like uh, birthing um, facilities are bad. Um, so to me, it's actually as important, if not more important than poverty as a determinant of Indigenous people's health. Right, and that's just in terms of accessing healthcare, but it interacts, it causes some um, like stress in our lives um, that is bad for our health. Um, so yeah, it's a hard problem to fix, right? Um, and people are very defensive and fragile. Um, there's been lots of work done by lots of people to try to um, like support healthcare providers to kind of get over themselves, right? Like and understand, like unfortunately as human beings, we're afraid of difference, right? And if we don't acknowledge that, um, then we treat people that we perceive as similar to us different than people who we perceive as different, right? Like, so that's some of the rooted things. So self-awareness and self-reflection are some of the key teachings. Um, people our age who grew up in Canada and went to school in Canada learned all like false history. So that's getting corrected now, thanks to all of those leaders out there that have rewritten like our curricula and our education. I know um, one of my my uh, my one um, daughter, um, like she had the same racist history textbook that I had, right? Like, uh, but that was. Um, a good 25 years ago. Um, so those things are changing. Um, so the things that I could think about concrete things in communities, right? People could make lists like of providers. We're working on the inside system. Like I'm working inside to try to set standards, right? And to try to measure um, the amazing Dr. Alika found Fontaine, like an indigenous doctor that's the president of the Canadian Medical Association. He's actually created an online tool where we can report racism. I just finished up a big study. I sent secret shopper patients, amazing Indigenous actors, into um, the emergency room and family practice clinics because um, a lot of these training programs, like, they don't really necessarily make the change. If it feels good, I said, it, it's probably not working, right? Because learning that we have our own biases and stuff, nobody goes... It's rare you'll find anybody that went into health and social services because they want to be mean to people, right? Um, but, you know, we have to reflect on our own social position and our privilege and relearn everything that we were taught about First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and then get comfortable with the actual skills to create safe places, to be a listener, right? Um, instead of a teller. We're trained as doctors to be the experts and share things, right? But we need to learn to be better listeners. I just heard about um, a program in the UK. It's to help um, Black patients feel safer. And like the healthcare providers were really like um, wearing stickers that say, I'm here to listen. So there are system level fixes, but what can we do? And maybe people in the audience have ideas too. So some of the things that we've done in cities like Toronto, um, like, and again, it's happened in midwifery and birthing care. We make lists of the providers, like, uh, and I'm trying to formalize that, um, but um, who's, is there providers that I'm sure we talk that are good, like actually as an act of reconciliation, um, I'm part at U of T then of a, the largest department in the country of training family doctors. They train more than half the family doctors. So there's 2000 of them. The funny thing is for the longest time, I was the only self-identified indigenous person there. Fortunately, there's more. Um, so I just said, okay, well, um, I want everybody to take on 10 indigenous patients, right? Like let's, you know, if you, cause I said there's 17,000 in um, Toronto that don't have a primary care provider. So, and then, but actually, and then we're trying to figure out a way that we could actually um, get people and people would want to get that. Like they, they've they been determined to be a culturally safe provider, right? And that should be determined by patients and, and stuff. And then, um, yeah, they could um, all just take on 10 patients. I mean, every care provider in the country is stressed and busy, but that's a little act. Um, so those are some of the ideas 
um, that I have over the shorter term. And then plus the other things about bringing somebody with you. Um, yeah, I would say you can all say, oh, my Auntie Janet, because people like, <laughs> like uh, said that I should come in with this problem. And then they're, they look and they're like, oh, Dr. Smiley, she wrote that like uh, first people second class treatment report and look oh she's been at these legal inquiries right and it's kind of sad but I think as healthcare providers too like I try to ask myself that you know like if some you know buddy like from the prime minister's family came in good like I want to make sure every single person I see I'm treating really well right so we all have that tendency like we'll perform a little fancier right sometime if we know you know, we're being held accountable. So that's the other piece we're trying to be, build in because there's social accountabilities, right? There are now rate your doctor networks, so we could use those. Um, and uh, like, I think um, I thought about like speaking to leadership, um, speaking to your health authority, right? Like uh, to try to identify actually that we have, forgotten we've had a priority I can remember in 2000 2001 when I was really worried about the health of our infants and families and then you know the elders said yeah and you have to worry about the grandparents too to have healthy infants and I was like oh okay um but I looked at all the health priorities for um AFN and uh Métis National Council ITK to see if maternal child health was on there and like it wasn't there right like uh for AFN anyways but yeah now we do have like this whole movement around midwifery but let's go tell our leaders that we need to have some investment in like aging in menopause in andropause for our men and people um, with testosterone right there's a whole bunch of men's health issues that people aren't talking about like when that prostate gland gets really big right so anyways I don't know those, that's a little bit of a brainstorm I hope uh not going too far off track but those were all the kinds of things but really this is a big problem so I don't have any easy fixes. I think those are all really great suggestions and strategies and I just wanted to maybe just add one more thought to that before we dive into quickly the Q&A's. Um, it racism is such like a ghost right it's like a haunting you can't it's hard to prove sometimes that it's happening but you know in your gut it's happening so I totally agree with you where I would rather someone outright say something to me about Indians or you know something like that because then I know for sure and I can prove it but when it comes to the haunting part and I can't really prove it but I know it's there um I think that's also when support groups become really important and, and the community organizing aspect. Because another thing is, you mentioned that your daughter was looking at the same textbook that you used 25 years ago or whenever. And I was thinking about that because even now when I look at when I watch movies that I watched in the 80s, for example, and I think, oh my gosh, I was watching that and I didn't think anything was the matter with that back then. You know, a lot of it is our people have grown so used to being treated that way that they don't even realize they're being treated that way. So a lot of it has to do with how can we educate ourselves and get that awareness up so that our people feel like that they deserve proper health care, good health care, so that they want to learn about it and learn how to advocate for themselves a little bit more. I think that's also part of the strategy is creating that awareness in our, our people. You know, no, no, that's not right that that doctor talks to you that way or, you know, things like this. So these are, I think, part of the strategy too, in terms of, like I say, community organizing. And, and maybe when we have our conversation with Lana around her community organizing around this, maybe that will come up there. So that was just, just a comment I, I just wanted to throw out. And um, just now my mind is peaked about this andropause and I'm gonna go look it up after we're, we're done all this, cause I never heard of that before, but now I'm gonna, go check that out um so okay that's that's just some comments that I had 
So um, unless menopause. you have anything. You... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm going to check that out. <clears throat> so no, if there's no... I just, mm, sorry, Tenny, you go. I have no pause time. It's a bad thing. You finish, please. <laughs> I was just going to say, if you had anything to respond to, then I welcome you to respond. And if not, we'll just jump into the questions. Just um, like I want people to believe their guts. Um, I wish I could be a mama bear. You don't all need me. But um, I just um, want to applaud all of you that are um, you have tried to talk to a healthcare provider. Um, and uh, yeah, it's... Um, I'm, yeah, just uh, wanting to um, send you good energy and healing energy um, as you try to work to get the care that is your human right to have. So now I'm good for the questions. Okay. So the first question I'll look at is, is it important to keep track of the last period? My last periods over the last 15 or 16 years ago were so irregular, light, and brief that I don't quite recall when I had the last one. Yeah, so that's, and it's funny because um, I was actually talking to a healthcare provider and luckily um, they had kept track of it. They were keeping track of it because um, it was my mental health care provider. And as I mentioned in the last um, webinar, um, because I have, um, like uh, to manage um, depression as a chronic health condition, um, then um, it became harder to manage during the perimenopause for me. So um, she kept tracking. So it's okay. Now we know it's something, it's, if we're going to celebrate it or whatever, that'll help us be tracking it, which will be really good, right? Because then um, we'll um, keep track of it. So yeah, it would be that last bleed right? The last menstruation, and it might have just been for a day or two of spotting because it can get later as it as it goes. But um, that's okay. I guess some of us, um, yeah, luckily that healthcare, I just know the month that it was in. I don't know the exact date, but maybe this is a new thing that we're going to support each other to do in that next generation. There's two questions that I wanted to get um, covered, uh, but because you just mentioned spotting, just briefly, is spotting normal during menopause and is it anything to be concerned about? Yeah, so it's normal during menopause, but we should um, be um, keeping an eye out for it because the problem is it could also be the sign of something else, right? Like overgrowth of the lining of the uterus being the most common thing. So that's why it is good to try to have a primary health care provider because an ultrasound and then there's something that sounds not very nice. It's called an endometrial biopsy. But when it's done well, it's not that much harder than a pap smear. They just stick a tiny little straw. I used to do them all the time into your uterus to get a sample of the lining of those cells to say, hey, are you guys trying to overgrow here, right? Or girls or are these cells, you powerful life force cells. Um, and uh, so it sh is something that you should talk to your healthcare provider about. And most of the time, um, at that time, like of the irregular periods and the spotting, um, I would always um, look at ordering an ultrasound um, because then um, those ultrasounds can tell us how um, thick the lining of the uterus is and help us figure out, okay, this is just some irregular um, menstruation because those eggs are not coming out every month or, you know, maybe um, like uh, it like the body was getting ready for the release of the egg and it didn't come out, right? Or there's something else going on here, like a problem with the cervix, like some irregular growth there, or problem with the lining of the uterus. Thank you. So we'll go from the top and just try and work our way down as quickly as we can. I know we're running out of time here. I mean, okay, this is like the snappers, yeah, right? Like yeah, the, yeah it's going to be. About? So see, okay, I'll think that way and then I won't okay. talk so much. And and the other thing too is we don't we're not limited to cut it off at seven thirty. Nothing's going to shut down if we go past that. But but just to, in respect of your time, we don't really want to do that. So Mary McHugh, I have a Mirena IUD that's uh, due to come out soon. I'm a bit worried about how this will affect me. Will this throw my hormones into a tailspin? I'm already struggling with dealing with all the extra weight I've gained and the hot flashes too. Um. So. 
if you're dealing with weight and hot flashes, um, if the marin is ready to come out, it might not have very min much hormones left in it anyways. Um, but what you could do is speak to the healthcare provider. Sorry, it might not have very much hormones left in it. I think that's what I said. I'm starting to get a bit tired too. Um, so talk to your healthcare provider because they could patch you over maybe with some hormones um, to help make that transition a little bit smoother. Thank you. Deanna Partridge, David, any suggestions for outrageously heavy and long perimenopausal period? My doctor suggests ob oblation. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. And then she put in brackets microwaving question mark of the uterine lining that scared me. And I didn't uh, also I didn't want to know when menopause actually starts. I'm not quite sure if I'm reading that correctly, but thoughts on procedure of this ablation. Yeah, so that would be one of those less invasive surgeries. So it sounds horrible. And of course, like who wants a microwave, right? Um, like, uh, but that's actually just um, high frequency. So like uh, burning, right? Like it's a special tool. So you know, 20, 30 years ago, they might have said, oh, you should have a hysterectomy. So now they're trying to give you something less invasive. They wouldn't have to cut you open. They would go through the vagina and the cervix. Um, and yeah, we they use that in um, different kinds of surgeries. So then basically that lining of the uterus that's giving you problems, they just um, give a high energy. So it's kind of like burning it. And again, that sounds horrible. Um, it's actually not that painful. That part of the body isn't very highly innervated. You would probably be asleep for it. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be more effective. The other thing that people might have heard of is a DNC or dilation and curatage, but that actually, um, the lining will just go back. I had to have one of those and I was like, oh, great. I won't get heavy periods for a little while, but then I got a heavy period. Yeah. Two months, so I was kind of disappointed. <laughs> um, but again, um, yeah, you need to maybe, I don't know that it's exactly like microwaves are just high frequency waves, right? Like, uh, thank you. That answers that. I've known, uh, Darlene Birch, I've known of someone who experienced menopause not long after becoming a widow. Can grief bring on menopause? Yeah. So hi, Di Darlene. Nice to talk to you. So stress can cause us not to ovulate, right? So it might've been like timing though, because you would think then um, if the stress went away, maybe um, if there was still an egg or two left, um, maybe um, it would sneak out. But yes, stress can suppress ovulation as you know. Um, so I think it would need, I think that person might've needed to be close to menopause anyways, um, or the stress ongoing. Um, and again, remember if that person is part of the grieving, they just stopped eating properly too right like uh, that can or lost a whole bunch of weight that can do that so i would say yes thank you uh amy, amy solo does the number of pregnancies factor into the start of menopause i'm not going to read the rest of the uh, details that she provided but just that question so not in your current lifespan but actually knowing that people were still having babies at 42 44 45 that means if they were still having babies they weren't in menopause yet um so um like numbers of babies and people having babies at older ages in your kin lines um will um mean that they had later menopause but not for your own life that i'm aware of does having many babies cause you to have um, early or later menopause. Okay, um, we have one by Kelly Davis. Uh, does the ablation ablation service, uh, surgery lessen the flow? Yes. Um, so that's just the same answer. Like, uh, so that ablation, that's another strategy. Sometimes, and it depends on what kind of ablation, like, so because you can just, um, like, uh, just remove all the lining, but then it can grow back but um, you can try to use microwaves or other kinds of um, techniques. So um, they will talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. And I just want to thank Jacqueline Lozon for her comment and reminding us and bringing up uh, 
uh, Brian Sinclair, who, if you're aware of uh, what happened to Brian, it's a, it, there's, there's certain cases, this was a, you know, a case of him waiting in the waiting room um, with an infection that took his life. Uh, and, and the racism played a factor in, well, didn't play, was the reason why he, he ended up dying for an easily treatable infection. And uh, it's always really good to remember uh, people and remember what they bring to us through the tragedy of their death, which is uh, awareness and education and a way to move forward and sometimes motivated uh, motivating uh, outrage which is justified uh, to, to do something about it and so we always want to acknowledge uh, Brian and and other people who lost their lives um, through through uh, racism within the healthcare system and uh, and what they you know and thank them for for bringing uh, bringing something good uh, to us unfortunately from their their death um and then the last comment was is from my dad so hi dad i didn't know you were in uh, listening into this this is that's kind of awesome you know uh, my dad uh, is a survivor of uh, prostate cancer so there we are into the you know the nice segue into into maybe tanya and i we're gonna have to discuss this further eh? once we start reading up on this what what did you call it again you called it the andro andropause, andropause. And, uh... I didn't even yeah that just that. makes my um heart yeah. lift there so yeah. thank you Tony and uh, my be mom being a Métis nurse um so I hope in the spirit world she's happy too so we're carrying on um some good traditions and I'm all in like I want to keep these conversations going so when you're you're ready Tony we'll start talking about prostate cancer and prostate hypertrophy like uh it's all discussions about uh conversations we haven't been having bridging conversations Mm -hmm. So thanks for your comment, Dad. <laughs> Praising Janet and and her uh, contribution to Métis people and how she um, assisted the Métis Nation of Ontario. And I I want to uh, just uh, thank Janet for that as well. Uh, the last question will be to Emily Brack Brackbay. Uh, I never know how to say <laughs> Kelly Davis. Uh, Davies has another one. Uh, we're, I, I want to be respectful of uh, Janet's time. So Janet, are you okay with answering these last two questions? Oh, good. Of course I am. Yeah. I'll respectfully ask that nobody else throw any up into the Q&A so that we can uh, give Janet a break after, <laughs> after these two questions. So Emily, uh, hi, Emily. It's nice that you're listening in. Uh, if someone had a hysterectomy in their 40s, would they go into menopause if they were showing early signs of perimenopause? Yeah, so that's a great question. So just like the grief question, like I think the hysterectomy could kind of tip someone towards going into earlier menopause. We know it does cause it. You still have your ovaries, but if your ovaries were um, kind of getting close to the end, um, we know the hysterectomy um, can... Um, make menopause happen sooner and the last question to Kelly. Can you hear me okay. okay yeah Rick. can you hear us okay now i can yeah can you hear me yep good okay um so Ke last question is to kelly davies um the doctor wanted to remove uh wanted to remove uterus instead of ablation because of fibroids any thoughts yeah, so it would just depend um, on the um, type of the fibroid or fibroids and if they're too large and what the symptoms are, because the ablation won't remove the fibroids. Um, there is something called a fibro fibroidectomy, right, or a myomectomy where they don't remove the whole uterus, they just try to remove some of the fibroid, but I think they can grow back too. Um, so that would be a good question, like, uh, to... Um, talk to like a, a surgeon about except that um, and the other thing is fibroids they can make the uterus big and bend back words and that can cause pain and discomfort so that might be if you're getting pain and discomfort from the fibroids um, then that might be why they're suggesting the hysterectomy because the ablation isn't going to shrink those fibroids enough right Thank you so much, Janet. Uh, you know, as Tanya was saying, her observation about yesterday's uh, sort of like we have these kind of moments where we're like, aha moments, a little bit of aha moments. And she was saying that yesterday, your comment about being uh, 
menopause being just the one day um, is was really interesting. And then today you added to that by saying, you know, when we look at other ceremonies, uh, the, back to the subject of ceremonies around around menopause and did we have any, you know, and when we look at the other ceremonies, you mentioned uh, one year being kind of some of these ideas, you know, we know that when people go into berry fasts, for example, they might have to avoid uh, eating certain foods for one year, they might have to use their own dishes for one year, they might have to not be able to pick up babies for one year, there's all these teachings around uh, people of uh, moon time and, and s within different nations, there'll be different teachings. Um, but the one year period, there's also within our grieving periods, right? Within our grieving ceremonies, sometimes we won't mention the, the name of a loved one for the period of one years in some communities that might be four years or, or whatnot, depending. I mean, everybody has different teachings and every single one of those teachings is right. None of them are wrong. So uh, they're just different. Uh, and by sharing these, it makes it really interesting to me now to hear you mention that one year period in that context because now i'm i'm thinking along the lines of what tanya was saying which is one year um we have those one year waiting periods and that feels like ceremonial in a way and then we come up to the one year you know period and there as tanya was suggesting when we spoke yesterday that there might be a way then to uh mark that in in a person's life in a in a ceremonial way um knowing that uh, racism is inherent in the healthcare system and that racism is, colonialism is racism, means that we as people with uteruses have a heart and, and the patriarchal system have a harder time uh, accessing uh, healthcare around this time in our life. Um, it, it's an important time for us. Um, it's maybe the most important in some cases. Uh, because we do enter a period that could last 50 years if we're so lucky and blessed to live that long. Um, and this is a huge significant part of our lives and how can we celebrate this coming into our power, as you so aptly put it, and as we've heard our other guests say. Um, I feel like we're, we are together um, trying to discuss this and fill in the blanks where so many exist. And I just want to thank you again, Janet, for for coming on, um, for being my sister, for being my friend, and for coming on and being our guest and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with all of us. I turn the mic over to uh, my friend and sister Tanya, and then uh, we'll we'll close off with last words to Janet. So I just really wanted to thank you as well, um, Dr. Smiley. I just wanted to. Um, make it a point to acknowledge your knowledge as a medical professional. Uh, I think it's been really valuable for a lot of the people who have been um, watching and who will be watching the recording. A lot of questions that were able to be asked in a, in a safe space um, and, and have acknowledgement by way of answer. So thank you very much for that. And thank you to everyone for um, being brave and putting your questions in the Q&A and, and letting us ask them on your behalf. Um, these are just conversations and discussions that we want to have to help us all get through this stage in our lives. How can we support each other? What can we do differently? What can we do the same? This is the idea that Christy and I have um, in all of these conversations and we're thinking about Hmm, okay, so now this is a new thing that came up about maybe we have a whole session about sexuality or, you know, different things that keep coming up that we don't think about right away, but want to add to our discussions um, as time goes on. So as you know, we, we all do this because we want to. This is not a job or part of anything. We're not sponsored by anyone. So I, I really want to thank you, uh, Christy, as well. And, and again, Dr. Smiley, for giving your time and effort for this. I think it's really helping. And I'm really looking forward to what comes out of this uh, for many of our people in our community. So um, with that, I'll just 
hand it over to Janet. Yeah, well, to say, uh, hi, hi, um, like, uh, what a beautiful opportunity. The uh, three plus hours has just flown by and um, yeah, it made me feel good too. It was very generative for me. Um, like, uh, so just good medicine like that can come um, when we do things um, as a group of relatives. Um, in this case, a group of relatives working together um, to have a bridging conversation. Um, and it makes me feel good um, because, uh, yeah, I spent all this time in these medical books. I can look things up and interpret it. So then I have, um, I, I like it when my piece of the puzzle is useful um, to the rest of the community. And uh, it's um, really got me thinking about different things too. And even just as I, um, because uh, like we can change our roles and what we do. So what a great opportunity and thanks to everybody that came to and that is listening because um, yeah, it's uh, effective to share things with like 50 people or 100 people versus it would have, I would have been tired out by having like 100 appointments to talk about all this stuff. So just um, excited about uh, perhaps an opportunity for me then at this stage of my career too to, yeah. Um, participate in some bridging conversations, like uh, share like some of that kind of boring medical stuff um, that I knew, make sure I'm up to stuff. But then in return, right, the gift is like uh, that we're building something new together and we're thinking and then together you bring us all together and everyone that came and then we're like, oh, that one day and then the one year because, um, you know, so I love it. I just love um, our uh, culture, my culture as a Métis person and uh, so very rich to be um, here today um, being able to um, yeah be part of the conversation so thanks again and um, I wish everybody a really great rest of the day and uh, looking forward to some more conversations over time. Thanks, Janet. I, you know, looking behind you, I, I can't like I keep seeing that line of that. Uh, I don't know what it is. A, a truss or something yeah. that's in your ceiling. It's yeah. the beam. Yeah, yeah it and makes then you look like you're in a, and then there's my Yeah, when you have it turned the other way, it looks like you're in yeah. a tippy. <laughs> I keep thinking. Yeah, that. okay. So it's just um so I'm in the attic of my old Toronto house, but um yeah, yeah my neighbor actually that was pretty good. He held on to the roof beam. So yeah. That's yeah. a little my little attic, my little uh yeah, treehouse TP. Yeah, your treehouse TP <laughs> in it's Toronto. Toronto. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Um, we'll see you next time. It'll be, um, I believe we're coming back for in the first week of May uh, with Lana Whiskey Jack to discuss community strategies and what people can do uh, in their community and with each other around uh, advocating or whatever it may be. Um, so we'll come back, uh, see you in the first week of May. I guess that I'm saying the first week of May like it's far away, but it's actually like next week. So we'll be back next week, I think, or the week after. Okay, thank you once again, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks for tuning in.